uh, and to to actually motivate it, right? Uh, so I'll use the time in the first lecture here to kind of go from the historical like what happened when when we transition into the day that we have computer and hopefully imagine right now the world without a computer all right how do we actually handle things what does it do to us what does it do to humanity and why do we care because everything that we talk about going forward that we will talk about it will be about how do we make one and we're going to learn how to make a simple one that we did in like the 60s all right nothing more complicated than that something simple all right and here's the goal the reason why we learn how to build a simple computer right is to to kind of know how it works and what happened when you run a program this is kind of similar to system skill right you run a program, you better know what happened. You are a scientist, you're an engineer, you should know the detail of what's going on. Even though in many cases, you can abstract away a lot of those concepts, right? But it's good to know if you have to follow this thing in detail, where to start, right? Um, to be a better programmer and to think out of the box. How many people here can, how many people here believe that I can remake a software? We code everything to make it faster. The software part through optimization, new algorithms, right? Those that should be possible. How about the hardware? And how many of you think that way? Hey, I want to make the computer faster, not by rewriting my code, not by introducing new features for optimization, but change the hardware. How many people buy a new computer for in your life? Why do you buy it? Yeah, to, to, to buy a faster hardware, right? So this is the first thing I would want you to think. Because you are in this area, computer science and computer engineering, you are right in the mix of like, hey, I can change the hardware too. And there's so many companies right now that also look into this direction. Right? How can I build a new hardware that do X and Y and Z faster? Right? Uh, project three is about what I would call single cycle MIP. MIP is an ISA. You've learned X86 from uh, Cisco, right? So those are the ISA that's used in what? Intel processor, AMD processor, right? MIP was uh, uh, an, I wouldn't say an older ISA to be honest, because X86 is really old as well. MIP is designed from a different chain of thought. X86 will have instruction for many, many, many of the things that you, in many cases, you don't even use, right? There'll be instruction for X and Y and C. There's so many instructions available to you. MIP is designed from the different aspects. I want to make an ISA that's simple enough, doesn't support a lot of instructions, but with this set of instructions, you can have a functioning computer and the programmer doesn't have to do a lot of crazy things to optimize your code. Somehow we call this risk ISA or reduced instruction set ISA. You might have heard about this keyword risk five. Risk five is like the grandchildren of this guy um, that a lot of hardware startup actually use nowadays. It's an open source, uh, open ISA, which means that if you use it, it's free. You don't have to pay anyone. MIPS ISA follows the same chain of thought. I want to make it simple, right? So your lab is to build a simulator. It's not an actual design, it's a simulator that will simulate uh, a handful of MIPS instructions. And with your simulator, you can write MIPS assembly and run it on your simulator. So now you can write an assembly on this assembly language we call MIP, which by the way, we use it in PlayStation and PlayStation 2. And then your task is to build a simulator that run those programs, all right? All right, so 
the first question we have to ask, what is homage? Right? So basically the idea is we design computers, right? We we need to fundamentally understand the circuit. We don't go and design new circuits, to be honest. Those are the job of the circuit people, circuit researcher, how to make it like even smaller and smaller. Those are those are magical things to us. Right? We just want to know the properties. But from that, we need to put them together to what? To serve some piece of software, something to be run. So we better also know some some software algorithm, what are being run? How does the code look like? What are the common things? Is it, does it contain a lot of parallel loop iteration? Does it contain a lot of graph and graph traversal? Because the way you look at this program and the way the program go from phase one to phase two, they are all different. And you can build the hardware to optimize for each of these things, right? You all learn about the cache, right? From the system too. Anyone remember the cache? Okay, what's compulsory myth? All right, I just need one of you to remember that. Compulsory myth, so that's three, three types of cache myth. Conflict myth, you go to the same set and the set is full, so you kick someone out. Capacity myth, your cache is full, the new guy come in, kick someone out, compulsory myth is the first time I see the address. There's no way that's going to be in the cache, but I never brought them to the cache, right? Nowadays, modern processor do tricks where it looks at your sequence of accesses, right? Let's say you are trying to increment everything in your array. What would be the pattern of the access? Yeah, I just do A plus one, A plus two, A plus three, right? Then if I need A zero, right now, A, A, A a plus zero doesn't guarantee almost like I'll need a one, a two, a three, a one thousand. We can use then what we call technique we call prefetching. I look at the history of what are the addresses I access so far, then I bring them into the cache ahead of time. Get rid of compulsory myth. I never have to go to the memory, right? Isn't those fancy? You can also do things. I I told you about the. Was it that remember VIPT, VIPT, uh, VIPT, and all those things where you can have the virtual address map to the different physical address, right? The, the thing is, if I can use virtual address as the tag, what's the benefit? Do I need to do a translation at all to get to my data in the cache? Who has the virtual address? The program, right? When you run a program, whatever address you have right now, that's the virtual address. So the CPU has it already. If I have to access the cache, and if the cache only store virtual attack, do I need the physical address at all? I can cut away PLB lookup. I can cut away translation, unless I need to go to DRAM, right? That's another possible technique. Uh, this one, I'm not sure if it's implemented, to be honest. I don't think so, but there are proposed, like research proposal that, hey, that's a lot of benefit in doing this. And our address is 64 bit. Why do we, I mean, virtual, uh, virtual address has been invented like almost 30 years by now, right? Why do we go with that design when your address is 64 bit? There's no need for you to have the same virtual address for two physical address anymore. Why don't you just have two different virtual address? Make sure they never they never overlap. Then we don't need the IPT at all, right? So these are when you know the software, when you know the hardware, it's like, hey, these are tricks you can do to make computers faster. Right? And you want to build a machine that match the user demand. For example, let's imagine you're running a hospital, right? And let's say you're running a newborn uh, board and you have a bunch of doctors there. Uh, and then there was a new baby that came out today. Sadly, they have some genetic disease, right? So one thing you can do is try to do DNA sequencing so that the doctor knows what's going on. Because if you look at just the baby alone, you try to diagnose the baby without this information, right? I mean, the baby, well, I'm not a doctor, sorry about that, but yes, the baby would look sick. There'll be some symptoms that they can check, right? 
But if you have information of, okay, what are the possible genetic disease from the sequencing data to aid in diagnosis, right? Then the doctor has way more information about what are the possible treatments to save the baby. That's life and death kind of thing, right? So that's the user demand. I want to be able to do this workload and run it. Hopefully within the day, the doctor knows what's going on. The current technology, sadly, in some places, it doesn't, it actually can take longer than one day. So there are actually actual scenario, right, where in this case, the baby might have to like, they pass away because computer is not fast enough. These are the user demands. Self-driving car. What are the different user demands? The computer is it plugged on? Is it plugged into some any power any power source? Well, to the battery, right? But the battery is not charged, so it's there's a capacity that's shared with what the car, right? So if you design a computer that runs that consume a lot of power then your car will run for a shorter distance, right, before each charge. But at the same time, the computing power would drop when you decrease the, the power feed into your computer, right? You need to know the demand. Now, this is what I would claim, which, to be honest, is overclaim because algorithm is math, and math exists, like, a long time ago, all right? So, um, I would claim, quote unquote, that this is one of the oldest area in computer science. Because if you don't build a computer, there's no, there's no compiler, there's no language, there's no computer language. Back in the day, we, we programmed with just plugging in the switch, right? With punch cards. Then we have languages because it's kind of annoying to do it that way, right? So this is one of the oldest area, but it's still active nowadays because there's always new demand for different piece of hardware because thank God, because you guys are good. Most software programmers are really good at inventing new things that would demand new hardware, which is awesome. Keep my job, all right? Thank you. Keep doing that. So here's the question. How to evaluate a hardware design? The obvious metric, performance, how fast is my CPU? How fast is my GPU? Right? But there's also more things like functionality. Cost, right? When you buy a new computer, cost is a big factor. You have limited budget. No one can afford a Mac Pro. Yeah. <laughs> it's true, right? It's true. It's really expensive. Usability, right? And these are things that would make a good computer. And if all the way I would say this is is all about making the right trade-off because physics and math dictate how far you can go. Then you have the cost as another trade-off, right? You don't want to break your bank to build something simple. Then you make the right trade-off for your application. Uh, that's a, that's a, always key goal in designing a good computer. Quick question. Let's say you have to design a CPU, right? What are some of the important things that you have to think about when you want to design a CPU? So let me ask you a leading question, right? What are the type of program that the user can run on the CPU? How many people is anything? How many people think it's anything? Yeah. Because CPU is fully programmable by any piece of language, like software languages, right? So you need to support every application. Things like GCC, things like compression, like SIP, right? Even things like YouTube, Chrome, Web Benchmark, all these things will be run on your CPU. So the way you design a CPU is like, I want to build this piece of software, uh, hardware, my bad, uh, this piece of hardware that are good at running everything. Hopefully they are good at running everything. What are some of the things that CPU are not so good at? Graphic rendering. It is good actually, it's not bad. But there's another different hardware that did a better job, the GPU, right? Why is that the case? Well, GPU back in the day, not now, were designed to render graphics. 
So NVIDIA and well, eight, anyone heard of this company called ATI? ATI technology was NVIDIA kind of rival between the two companies, they built graphic card. ATI was brought by AMD, so now AMD GPU is built back then with ATI technology, right? When I was in uh, middle school, high school, I was basically deciding between NVIDIA cards and ATI cards. Now it's AMD cards. Um, then they were like, okay, we need, we have a lot of new application back in the day, right? Use the app, anyone know Pong? There's a game called Pong. Yeah. It's like the first game, right? How much graphic capability you need to run that? Not a lot, right? And then at, at the time, people were like, hey, these things are kind of fun, quote unquote, relatively, right? But then you can invent new type of games and you have game console and everything, right? And then many companies are looking, hey, if we need to draw this image a lot of time, right? We better build a special ship for these guys. So there are multimedia ships back in the day that were created, right, to display things on your monitor. Uh, there were times when I go to a computer store, right, and the the, the guy at the shop asked me, like, am, am I playing basic games or not? Because the, like you might want to buy a motherboard with a like multimedia ship, not even a GPU back in the day. It was old, really old, right? Yeah, sorry about that. I'm old. Now, now it's like you, you, if you want to run something, you have a choice of buying a computer with an on chip GPU, right? Then you can run simple games, maybe like 8 bit game, right? And then you can also buy an off chip GPU on your machine, right? That works pretty well when you want to run like small fancy games. The way they design these things, because they know that I just need to accelerate that one application, I change the hardware design. Obviously, right now, if you want to run like the OS on a GPU, I can write a code to do that. It's annoying, and I don't want to do that. And no one would like to do that, and no one did it. Okay? But for graphic pipeline, things like I want to draw dots, connect them together, do a lot of this geometry calculation, linear equation, GPU is really good at that. And it turns out they do a lot of metrics on reply really well as well. And machine learning happened to use a lot of that. And a lot of scientific benchmark also use metrics multiply for scientific data. It happens to map well with the GPU. So you see, anyone look at NVIDIA stock price? Also AMD stock price. There was a time I was like, I was intern at AMD before and I loved the company, right? Uh, at the time, and around I think 2013, 2014, I was looking at that stock price, I think $2. I was like, maybe I should buy this company because when I interned there, I loved it. I loved the culture and I, I feel like, yeah, that's a good company, right? Um, anyone check the stock price of AMD and NVIDIA right now? Yeah, if I buy it at a time, I get 60, 60 X in 10 years. Yeah, at a time, I don't have the money because I'm a poor graduate student and I already have like other stocks. So I'm like, okay, I'm, I'm a whole office for now. I, I now own AMD stock, by the way. <laughs> it's, it's not 60 X for sure, <laughs> far from that, all right? In any case, right, these companies now start, uh, skyrocket because of ML and AI workload because they are also really good at doing that. Um, now, these are the, the key goals. And once you know what application you have to build for, it's like when you know the goal, like what's the problem, then you just design the algorithm that matches the problem, right? Use the right tool for your job. Basically, architecture is building the right tool for you. You're building the tool for you. So here's the role of architect and architect. I borrowed it from my my advisor, uh, owner Mutlu, and his bo he borrowed this from his advisor, Yale Pat. Yale Pat is like one of the most senior people in architecture is at UT Austin. Um, he did a lot of really, really seminal work, especially on branch prediction, which you will learn uh, the topic actually in, in this module. So Yale Pat said that you need to be able to look backward. You need to be able to examine old code understand the design trade-off. 
right? Why does it work? Why does certain thing not working well? Then you need to analyze and evaluate previous proposals because you need to know how, why do things turn out this way? Why do things turn out this way? For example, I can ask you the question, why is Thailand turn out this way in year 2023? And you're gonna have a lot of answers, which we will not answer it right now because I'm recording, all right? But the, the, the thing is, once you know the history, once you look backward, you know what is the right decision, what is the not so right decision, and you can now make informed decision forward. Then you need to look forward, listen for dreamers. By the way, these are software developers that would complain it to you. Like, hey, I wish the hardware can do this. I wish the hardware can do this. Yeah, that's my job, right? To build the hardware for these guys. So this is basically where you push the state of the art design, right? You also need to look up, know the nature of the problem. By look up means that look at the the compute stack from problem, algorithm, compiler, OS, runtime, and architecture is way down the stack, right? So you need to know the nature of the problem up the stack. What's wrong with the algorithm? What's restrictive? What's doable and what's not doable? What is a restriction on a compiler? Can I assume compiler can do X and Y and C? Or if I make that assumption, the compiler friends will start to kill me because they cannot do it. What's the system overhead, right? Uh, in, in many cases, we are not always right on that, but it's good to know that we need to look up in the stack and know what are the restrictions, what are the constraints, and look down to material science and physics to know what's going to be in the future. Because the role of an architect, like the computer architect, is similar to an actual architect. If you need to build a building, right? Back in the day, what other tools do you have? Concrete, steel beam, right? Maybe they cannot fabricate a large, like, pane of glass that would withstand a strong wind, for example. Then if you look back at houses like 1,000 years ago, right, it will look so different. It would look pretty primitive to be like maybe wood or like brick, right? And doesn't have a lot of windows or large windows because we can't do that back in the day. It's so expensive. Nowadays, if you look at buildings, it's like skyscraper with just a bunch of glass everywhere, right? And I don't even know what are the material for the future, but I'm sure civil engineers know that is aware of that, right? Same thing here. You used DRAM before, right? We all use DRAM in all the computer. How many of you realize that's also new DRAM, like something memory material that's not DRAM anymore? Smaller, about the same speed, a little bit slower, but now you can have terabytes of those things. Much more compact, much more power efficient. And it doesn't go, like the data doesn't go away when you turn the power off. You turn the machine off, right? The data is there. If you turn the machine max back on, that's maybe potential benefit of like a really quick restart, right? Where you can turn off the power, coming back, everything is there. The state, you can retain the state. Also, if you retain the state, is that a safe thing to do? What if another user come in and turn the power on? How do you ensure privacy, right? So new things come up with new technology. And be, being aware is nice because you know what tools you have. Don't work with tools from 10 years ago, basically. These would allow you to know, hey, these are potential future tools for you. So here is the computing stack. Some of you saw this slide already, but it's like a, a, a high mentality. I have web development, front end, back end, black magic. How many people think that way? All right, how many people, before you are in this class, how many people look at web app that way? Yeah, how many people, I know that you hate the class and you know, I know you hate the project, but with this, you kind of, hey, this thing exists. You are now aware that this thing exists and they are signs, they're not black magic, all right? Again, many, many of the things that we have nowadays, 
Science is cool. That's why I like it. And you guys should like it. Now that you're too old to change, <laughs> too old to change what you learn. <laughs> too deep in, yeah. What are you gonna learn from now? Well, we covered the runtime already, the OS, the network. Now we're gonna go into the ISN microarchitecture. And the design choice would affect, what we do in the hardware could affect software programmers. So one of the, usually one of the good things to do is make sure that the programmer are not aware of what we're doing. If you buy a new computer, you don't have to upgrade your software. That's the best thing. Somehow it's not achievable. If you want certain features, you might want to satisfy, hey, you need to, you have to have this software update, all right? And architecture and system with link gates and wires, which are some things that electrical engineers should know, to the computer code, uh, that that you you are aware right now. Um, most of the time, if you look at colleges in the U.S. and everywhere, you will find that this is a topic that always sits in the middle between the computer science department and the electrical and computer engineering department because we need to know quite all of them at least the basic right so now the this you saw this already from the skills just to reiterate right when code goes kaboom without any reason if you know this thing it helps um uh, advanced in hardware, uh, enabling technology, even things like modern machine learning will not be as prominent. I can tell you this. It is a, I think it's true. I think it's a true statement. It's a fact. Without the GPU, without emerging hardware, there's no ML. There's no chat GPT. They have run on, a, well, it's a specially built GPU nowadays for ML and AI, even not for graphic applications. All right, even things like IoT, right? All your smart uh, smart devices, there's a lot of trade off with power efficiency, how to make it smaller, how to make the code size so small that fit in these devices, right? Or even things like cool graphics, video games. How many people look at games 10 years ago? How does the graphic look compared to now? Yeah, it's like, it's different. It's different and it's, it can be super pixelated. That's like corner everywhere. Human doesn't look as human. Um, and it can, it's gonna keep changing. I think I, I remember some, some people, some students here show me like the Unreal uh, demo. Oh yeah. Oh, yeah, that was insane. That was insane, uh, right? And, and it's gonna be even better going forward. So I kind of will wrap this up that there's so, so many modern day workflow, things like AI, ML that run on PyTorch, PyTorch is kind of take over now, um, and like IoT, uh, even like distributed learning, distributed uh, uh, federated learning, or even things like that, which is, uh, that's a phylogeny tree of COVID-19 to try to figure out how many mutations happen so far. So we know how to build new generation of vaccines and all those things, right? Uh, it demand, these things demand new hardware. That's why we keep buying, well, that's why government has to buy new supercomputer because the, 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 that's a demand, right? But it requires good system design and we need to handle the diverse type of workload. And architecture, which is what we go, we're gonna go into, and system, which is what you've seen already. This kind of research would impact all modern applications. Right? And that's, I'm gonna go sidestep here a little bit because I, I had a, a colleague of mine who are uh, at, can I say it at a university? Uh, let, let's not say university because I'm recording. But like some colleague in Thailand, before I come back here, they basically ask me, hey, I do come art, right? So what can we, what are you going to be doing here? It's not useful. Like what type of application would be, would make yourself useful? And I'm like, yeah, whatever I do, it impact everyone. 
because it's like I, I'm, I'm basically make computer faster right and imagine the world without without us like without a computer like, you will never exist right so this is what I would characterize that the, the work in system, for example, would impact all these applications and is, is needed. And the thing is, my job is to make sure that everyone never realizes that we exist. Because the time you realize that we exist is the time when hardware goes, <laughs> goes down, right? Like, hey, this thing is too, too bad. I buy this new GPU, it doesn't work, it runs slower. Then it's always bad thing when, when you realize that the system people involved, right? Like the third certain version of Windows that are notorious for like being bad compared to other versions, right? I mean everything is relative. Also, again, when you do system work, you don't want to make like you want to make sure the user never realize that, that, that these things that they have to be run. It should be as silent as possible to the user. It should be as simple as possible. Now, uh, whoops, that's not your project, my bad. We changed the project, it was from uh, last semester. Some real world example, like graphic machine learning AI, right? Um, we, oh, sorry, we used to run games. Uh, we buy a GPU to uh, go and shoot uh, tyranny um, and dictators. Uh, we use it to save the world and Torture yourself in Elden. Anyone play that game? Yeah, it's like, yeah, you want to torture yourself. I don't have the money to buy it yet, so I'm still waiting for them to go on discount to buy and torture myself. Um, yeah, you too, right? So, and also you can use the GPU to run like this modern, uh, modern application on ML AI scientific application. Nvidia also has have this thing called like, uh. CU quantum, which is basically now do quantum simulation, right? So they have a lot of new uh, libraries uh, that are being launched for different purposes. Um, but also GPU can also be a uh, uh, slow as well, if you don't know how it works, right? If you heard about this new A100, it's not new anymore, it's been there for a while, right? A100 GPU is really, really powerful, but if you don't know the hardware and you build a program that are not parallel at all, it's gonna be slower than your probably your desktop CPU. Why is that the case? It's not designed to run one thing at a time. It's designed to run ten thousand things at the same time, right? So you need to write a program now. If you want to write a program, you better know the hardware. That's why this is a required course because I want you to know the hardware so that when you build the program, you roughly have an idea on what hardware are you running on. Okay, we'll talk a little bit more about the GPU when we go to the fun part. That's like toward the end, there'll be some demo on SIMD, single instruction multiple data that is used in a GPU, and that actually enables how GPU can be super fast. Otherwise, it's going to be really slow. It's going to be even slower than the CPU, right? Or even things like, like, IO management, right? This is a little bit different from what we covered so far, right? These are how do I manage IO on a mobile or an IoT. For example, uh, there was an experiment that I did with uh, my colleague at uh, in Hong Kong, and what we found is like uh, when you use the, the the mobile phone, right? Each app would use the file differently. Facebook, YouTube, Google Maps, Google Earth, TikTok. Chrome, they use the file at a different different rate of use, different frequency, and somehow you don't even have reuse, right? So can we manage the file on your phone? Because when you don't have to download the file from the internet, it's faster because locally it's on your phone already, right? But the problem is how big is your phone uh, uh, disk? 64 gigabytes, 128 gigabytes, right? It's limited. You can't store every single file, right? On top of that, there's also a technique called cache cache, which actually now put the file inside DRAM for even faster access. And every OS do that. So your phone that has two or four gigabytes of memory also have to store the file, right? So if that's a benefit on managing this well, 
uh, we actually get better performance, better reliability. Right? Uh, this paper has been published a while ago, actually, it's like I think two years, um, uh, two years, three years, it's like 2020 and 2022. Um, and also things like container versus serverless. Anyone heard of serverless uh, uh, architecture? So serverless is when you think of say cloud application. Usually you have to do the back end work on configuring everything, making sure all the component work, build it up, make sure it run, make sure it run on the cloud. Serverless is more like that's an API. I call the API and then I run the application assuming that that's my function call and that's it. Think of imagine like things like RPC call that we learned from, from Tuesday, right? I call the function and that's done. Yay, that's it. Now here's the thing. This thing looks magical, but who managed all this function call? The server, right? So now that's more more on the the uh, more along the line of now, do I have to change the system? Obviously, yes. Yeah. Do I have to change the hardware? There are more and more data that the serverless doesn't really run run as efficiently as container because the hardware is not designed for a a short function call. There's a lot of optimization in hardware that are based on history, what you've done in the past. Let's say I run a program, right? Let's say I run YouTube. How long do you open YouTube for? 10 minutes, five seconds, five. Even five seconds, right? That's, that's a long time in the computer world, right? But when you have this service setting up, there's a lot of data streaming, right? But with, with serverless runtime, a lot of function calls are short in millisecond range. You run and then done, run, done, run, done. The hardware that was trying to build some history, it's like, hey, this application behave this way, oh, it's gone. And I said, another application get lost, like, oh, this is it's gone. I don't even have the history information for my optimization, and the hardware becomes the hardware optimization built previously become not as useful. Now, basically, these are basically serverless framework you can call kind of like hello world, right? Usually back uh, with the container, you have Docker that would run the service on the cloud, right? Uh, now you can say send a request over, right? And that'll be an API gateway. The request say, hey, I want to run this API or function call, right? Then on the server side, there's a worker thread coming in. Oh, okay, someone wants to run this. I take that stat request, then would basically run run the workload. In this case, if I want to look up the database, it go the worker go and look up the database or a shared database and reply right back to your Facebook client so that you can stop your prep. All right. Uh, that's all like a lot of paper actually there's like a lot of research now going into like what i said earlier dna sequencing right is the gpu good enough right now the state of the art the application side baseline is hey we can run on a gpu and it demands about 48 gpu to run together to do it really quick enough and i think i think the guinness world record is like three hours for sam one sample which is a really, really impressive time, right? But then also people like me who are like, hey, can we build the hardware for this guy? Why do we want that? Not just about performance, but can we build something smaller? I don't want to carry a cluster with 48 GPU everywhere, right? What if I can have a small device or small computer that, that's good enough, right? everywhere in a, in a more local hospital, right? So that way, not everything has to be transferred over to the large center to do sequencing. Uh, so there are things like read mapping, basically you have read, reads are a chunk of uh, 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 that 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 you want to sequence. And then because we are all human, if you have a reference genome that say, hey, this is human, human genome. All of our DNA will, will look something like that with some minor differences for mutation. That's why I look different from you. 
there are some mutation between three to five percent, which means that if I have a bunch of these letters for me and a bunch of letters for the reference, I can do a string matching. This is like the grab grab workload, but it's an approximate grab, right? Because I can have up to five percent error for mutation. I do this approximate grab to sequence back. This is how my scheme looks like. And with that, and the additional information about if you have mutation here, you might be like to get hard to see it. If you have mutation here from this base to this base, from A to C, T to G, you might have cancer, the increased chance of cancer of certain genetic disease, right? That way, the doctor can say, okay, for this patient, here is how I would treat he or she. Certain uh, uh, mutation also would say that, hey, this drug works better than this drug. So now you can have a concoction of what we call personalized medicine. So we don't have the drug for every, like, it's not like everyone take the same drug. But now for a really, really, uh, 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 wait, super technical disease that is hard to treat, you might want to figure out what drug is the most effective at treating each person. But these are costly, right? So the more we can drive the cost down by better hardware, better process, it will make it even more life-saving, right? Life-saving medicine also come at a cost. So you want to also brought the cost down. So we also can look into things like storage system, right? That's also a lot of information you have to bring over from just because this information is big. It's like terabytes of data or gigabytes of data. That you have to process. Can we do some optimization on the the computing side as well as the storage side, right? To bring the cost down. For example, uh, we had published, I think, two, three. Uh, for me, it's like two 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 different papers and looking into a little bit more on this direction on how to bring the the the, the cost down in terms of energy and the performance up, right? By optimizing the hardware on the disk on your ssd right so these are things that I, I i guess i hope look a little bit more interesting now that you know that you can change the hardware don't always assume that you have to live with your cpu and your gpu forever all right and with that in mind let me ask what the computer i think i asked this like in how to call and, and it's funny how, how the answer changed over time, over also how old you are. So what would, what would I define as a computer? Right? So these are like, yeah, electronic device for storing processing data, right? Oops. Now, the question I want to ask you, this is more of the topic today. What is a good computer? What do you want? You sound like someone who just, uh, who just bought a computer. All right, so to sum it up, really fast, I have a lot of CPU core. Cheap. Yeah, I'm cheap. Efficient. Power efficient, right? Um, the what? Reliable. Reliable. Okay. Um, <laughs> yeah. All right. Who like the Nokia 3310? Yeah. You could probably kill someone with that thing by throwing it. Um. Are you old enough to use that phone? The the, the phone that was a meme right now. Okay. I was old enough. I'm, I I am. I am old enough. Sorry about that. It's the wrong 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 tense. I'm over now, and yeah, that thing. There was a time I dropped it like one, like one full flight of stairs. What happened to that is it doesn't break. It just the battery compartment pops up. I put everything right back. It functions. Yay! Back on the stairs. Back on the floor. Huh? Back on the Uh, no, it actually doesn't break that much. You probably have to like do this. Uh, expert a lot of force to, to have a crack, but yes, I, I understand the meaning. So a good computer actually can have a different reasoning, 
right? If I want to buy, uh, uh, create a good computer for a phone, for example, it should be power efficient. If I want to do it for a supercomputer, to be honest, also need to be power efficient, because I don't want to have a power plant next to me, right? How many of you also know that a, a good data center, for example, also might want to actually be able to function when there's a power outage? Ow. Okay, so let's say I need to maintain a huge data center, right? Say Facebook or Google, let's say Google or Gmail. Does Gmail ever go down? Well, almost down. Almost never, right? But let's assume I just have one one data center. How do I make sure it's up as much as possible? Generator. Generator. Wonderful backup. backup. Well, in this case, let's say backup doesn't help. The power plant goes down. I mean, how 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 many times here in Thailand at your home where you don't have power? Many, right? EGAT are so good at, well, I mean, I, I actually, I can't blame, blame them because there's multiple entities who serve us. But I mean, power can go down, right? And it's just a normal thing because things are not perfect. And it's going to be kind of like your life, right? So how do you make sure that the data center runs? UPF generator. Many data centers also employ two power source. In case one plant go down, the other plant can still maintain the whole thing, right? There are even extreme example where there are two power source, one from one country, the other one from another country. Oh. Yeah, that way, if that country is down, the power is down. Hopefully, the other country power plant is intact, right? Uh, so again, it depends on your demand because this thing costs a lot. Right. So back in the day, uh, we have things like mechanical calculator. Anyone seen? Oh, anyone heard about this thing before? Yeah, mechanical calculator. Yeah, I'm curious. Actually, I never really looked it up. Let's try. Is there a video of this thing? Ah, all right, let's 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 watch this. All right, so this is my pinwheel mechanical calculator that I recently purchased online. And it's uh last produced in 1958, uh, this particular model uh, in Italy. And, all right, um, I, I'll, I'll go forward. I, I don't want to spend eight months, uh, eight minutes on this video. Right? Well, let's take a number like 25. To the bottom, wow. and then clear that and subtract three. So counterclockwise, and that subtracted three from twenty-five. Oh. Yep, that twenty-two. Um, okay, so there's over here. There's like a the leveling. Let's say if you rotate clockwise, it's like a plus or multiply. If you rotate counterclockwise, it's subtract. And you can put in like two numbers, I think, and then do the calculation. It's pretty fancy, right? So that's a mechanical calculator. What's the difference between that thing and your computer? Why does it weigh a ton, right? <laughs> okay, uh, uh, a lot smaller, right? A lot, a lot smaller, uh, a lot more powerful, right? Uh, yeah, definitely faster. Can I program mechanical calculator? Yeah, you just saw the example. I explore something before I do the ad, right? Another example, some of you might have seen this uh, picture already. It's called Jackpot Loom. Uh, you can see that this thing are uh, punch cards per se. It's the pattern that you want out of your your piece of clothes that they are about to put together. On the left side here, it's just threads that you can build pattern with. And the loom put them together, right? Uh, fun fact. You see why anyone kind of feels that we call this thing threading? Multi thread. Multi threading. You see, that would before, right? It just happened that that cut loom, 
uh, basically combining the work of each thread together into a piece of code. And if you use NVIDIA GPU before, you will also realize that this group of threads, a group of threads is called a warp. It's happened that this thing at the, the bottom here, when you put things together, when you group threads together, that is called a warp. So the naming, actually, if you are confused, like why this naming, I have a gut feeling it has a lot of historical reason with that thing. Right? Uh, then as an any app, uh, if you have, if you happen to be in Philadelphia, the machine is at the University of Pennsylvania, right in Philadelphia in the US. Uh, it's in the, it's kind of like a museum room. You can go in and take a picture, which is what I did with my friends here. Uh, it's designed by Ecker and Moxley. Um, by now that name becomes like a, a top award for computer architecture, to be honest. Like if you got this award, it's actually, you basically recognize for like being really, really good at what you're doing. Um, they have 18,000 vacuum tubes, 30 tons, and it's huge. So you don't want to move this thing. It's not really movable. Uh, it's programmed using all the switch you saw from the picture, all the clock you see. Uh, then there's a lot of hardware advances in the 40s and the 50s, right? That's uh, ABC, uh, that's C3 and C4, uh, Suzuki. Uh, I think that was uh, German. If I remember correctly, the C3 or C4, one of them actually get bombed during the war. So these are, these are actually machines used in the war. The Bombay. Anyone saw the movie Imitation Game? That's the machine. It's called the Bombay, uh, built by Turing and his team. Then the same the same lab, right? The best, uh, so if you watch the movie, the area they're working at is called Beshley Park. So that's kind of like a secret lab in the UK that do a lot of code cracking, building a machine to like intercept uh, any message related to the war, right? Uh, if you, I mean, if you, if you are like historic, uh, history, uh, if you love history, right? You might have heard that the World War II was, some people would say it this way, right? Um, it's won by the British intelligence, the, the team that do this, uh, intercept, like massive intercept. American, uh, like, like production, basically the factory that produced like tanks and other things. And then the Soviet uh, manpower. Yeah, so that's what the British do. The Colossus basically is designed after the Bombay to crack the next gen code from the Germans. Because I mean, both sides will keep improving the, the encryption, basically, right? Then on the US, it was like, hey, uh, any app uh, popped up. The unique thing about the any app, if you watch the imitation game, you saw how the machine works. So it's just mechanical parts rotating. So it's powered by electric, but the programming is mechanical. You turn all those knobs. Now the difference here with the ENIAC, and that's why we call it the first digital computer, is ENIAC, everything is digital. There's no moving part. To be honest, if you think about it, if I think about it, like the pros and cons are like, if, you, if, it, if it's all digital, right? It basically means that hopefully maintenance is cheaper. You don't have to replace all the parts, right? Um, hopefully programming is easier compared, compared to all these machines. Then we have uh, one Neumann, which another like, so these are four father of computer. If you see any of these names, well, Turing, uh, Edgar is mostly one Neumann, their names are everywhere. Their names are on a bunch of awards as well. Right? The Turing Award, one Neumann Award, um, uh, Morris Wilkins Award. Uh, so the, the Edwack, then followed by the EdFact. EdFact is the first machine that has the store program, the store program model. We will we'll talk about this toward the end of this, this class. What do they mean? It basically now shifts toward, now at this point, the way computer works is the same as what you have right now, fundamentally. Fundamentally. We're at the point that it converges to what you see right now on your computer. Now you have the 
IIF from Bigelow. And then after the point, people, well, I, I guess engineer, if, they, if you have to keep turning knobs and plugging in this, this port, right? They'll get sick of it. And they'll realize that, hey, maybe it's a good time to buy, build the software to run things, right? So you, you then see the emergence of software, for example, that Fortran in 1954. I mean, imagine if you need to fix the Fortran code, how do you find that people? I think you know, I've seen a story. Let's do it during the break. I remember seeing a story that there was some piece of code in Fortran or Co uh, like COBOL that broke, and they basically have to then call like this retiree who were the programmer back in there to like fix it, please, because we don't want to program this thing, right? Then you have the age of Moore's law. Moore's law basically talks about you can cram more transistors. Uh, like the number of transistors would double, I think, every certain number of years. The way I said, I think, is hopefully the trend keeps going up. I mean, the, the trend stay, but I mean, it changed a little bit now. It changed a little bit now because physics, we can't make things smaller. It's really hard to make things smaller nowadays. Moore's law back in the day, it doubles every two years, right? Nowadays, it doesn't do the two year doubling, but still a lot. The rate at which you can put the transistor in. Uh, this is a paper in, well, it's an observation paper in 1965 by Gordon Moore. Um, if you talk to some Intel folks, they might be joking that, I mean, the reason Moore's law behaves this way is because he owns Intel. And because if your boss says so, I need to make sure it's double. But yeah, I mean, there's a push, right? I mean, it makes sense to be able to have more transistors. Why? Why do I want more transistors? Yeah. So let me back it up by using something you know already, the cache, right? How many people have questions? Why do I have four megabyte cache? Why don't I have eight? I have more space, right? Why wouldn't it be nicer if I would have a machine that have eight megabytes of cache? You need the transistor to build the cache. So from four to eight, you need more transistor. To support maybe one fancy instruction, you also need transistor. So everything, this is like the basic building block of your computer. The more you can cram in, the more you can put on your design. At some point, you can't design your hardware to do crazy things because you have limited transistor. Right? So basically that, that goes into the, the, the answer why more transistor. And you can keep doing this and this and do this uh, forever. I have a really good optional reading by Yale Pat, uh, the same guy that, that do the look forward, look backward, look up, look down. Um, he had a, a, another uh, paper that talked about, these are the possible bottlenecks and these are the good research opportunity back in 2000. And since you are, we are in 2023, right? Uh, it's kind of good to reflect and read into this, this topic and see how many things actually turn, turn into something true based on what you have right now. This is a little bit uh, too ad, uh, advanced for your level, but if you want to check it out, let me know. I will be more than happy to kind of discuss the paper with you. Um, again, uh, now modern computer has different looks. Uh, you, saw this slide many times already, and you also would realize that I never updated the iPhone picture. Yeah, that's me. Um, then you also have look into the, the instance, this is the from Cisco, like if I have a program that's through I plus J, right? what actually happens uh, from the way from program, it has, you have to go down, down to the micro architecture level. So my motivation right now is we are about to learn this guy. We learned this guy already. We kind of talk about this guy in system skill. We are about to learn how the hardware actually works. Now, the first thing is uh, the von Neumann model, right? It's a store program computer. There are two key properties of this. Now, this is, we are shifting from historical uh, lecture to an actual thing that we, are, we, we need to know. Store program computer means that your program is linear and is stored in the memory. 
then your data is also unified with the program, which means that your data is also in the memory. Then the control signal, which is whatever the program counterpoint to plus the, the meaning of your instruction, tell you if the store value are data or instruction. And that's it. That's the model. Programs are in memory, data in memory, and the program counterpoint to the program, and then there's a pointer that points to the data, and then you can work with everything. The, this allows sequential instruction processing because your program is like a block of data in the memory. It means that if I start from here, the first line in my main function, line by line by line by line by line, and you're done, right? So. This means that if I want to process one assembly line or one instruction, fetch the instruction, execute the instruction, finish the instruction by if it has to update certain things, update them, and then go on to the next line. Now things are simple. This is basically simplify a bunch of things, right? Program counter then point to uh, point to the current instruction. Sometimes we call the program counter the instruction pointer the same thing. Program counter instruction pointer is the same thing. Instruction register, you might see it in, in some of the manuals, say instruction register, these are different. Instruction pointer or the program counter store where is the instruction? Instruction register store your actual instruction. So whatever the instruction is, like add, move, those are in the instruction register. Then the program counter would sequentially advance, go line by line by line by line, except for what? When do you stop going to the next line? And when you're done with the function call, when you have if else, when you have for loop. So what? Power up. Okay. Yeah. Yes. That stops everything. So yeah, that counts. So here's the one Neumann model. You have the control unit which store your program counter and the register file, right? You have input, output. You have the processing unit which is add, subtract, multiply, and you have the memory. Now the memory, the way you would access the memory, usually you can envision it this way. I have two more registers. One of the register would store the address. One of the register would store the data. So if I want to go to the address 10, then I put number 10 in here. It means that I want to go to address 10. Then I would have the read and write signal into the memory. Do I, am I reading? Am I writing? And then based on the data, for example, here 25 means that I go to address 10, write 25 to memory. That would allow me to process the information. Now, in this case, the input and the output, the I.O. directly talk to the memory, right? And the data would go back and forth between the processing unit and the memory. Then the control unit in your CPU, which has your program counter, would go in and say, hey, what's this line? Then the instruction register would say, okay, this line is add A and B together. So we go add, go to register file, add the two data, write it back. Now, when you have to do produce some output, output also takes the data from the memory. Then the dotted line here is, is coming from the control unit. Think of it as your brain that sends all the signal for me to move my hand or look at your, the classroom. Right? So that's a brain signal. We call this control signal. So that's the dashed line here. Basically, control everything. Right? Is this the only model? No. This is one of the most dominant. So major instruction set architecture, things like X86, ARM, MIP, RIS-5, Spark, Alpha, IBM Power, use this model. What's the alternative? Alternative is what we call the data store model. So we'll go into more detail in fun part on this model. But the, the, the key idea is now von Neumann, Fetch and execute instruction in control flow order. Control flow means the way your program runs. Huh? 
So we talk about this like first lecture of Fun Horror because it does have a lot of care. Were you there? Oh, yeah. Oh, okay. Oh, even that is teaching, I don't think he, he talked about it. That's why I put it here. So the data, the fun, fun part, when you use a functional program, I see data flow. Because when data arrives, it starts to run right away. So it has a lot of uh, similarity with the data flow model. And also a lot of similarity why they are fast. All right. So von Neumann, you run the instruction control flow order, means that whatever your code is, you go from your code, the first line to the last line. So that's control flow, right? You go, here's the line you're running, execute, finish, go to the next line, execute, finish, go to the next line. Data flow model means that I don't care about what line am I running. If I know that this addition has to be done before this subtraction, I'll just make sure that whenever there's a data for my, my adder, I finish the add, then feed the data over. So it's about the data, where, where does the input coming from? If I have all the input, I do it right away. It computes whenever I have the overran, regardless of what line you are. Let's say the last instruction is line 10. Then you have another instruction line 100, but you happen to have all the input, that line 100 go, because why not, right? There's no instruction pointer in the pure data flow model. There are actually people who try to build that for a while. Uh, historically, it's been kind of being on the research side of things. Uh, we kind of approximate this model. And before, before we wrap up, I'll talk about how your CPU actually do this. So the ordering is based on what we call data flow dependence. Do I have the input? If I have the input, I do it right away. All right, think of a math function. If math function has all the input, there's no need for me to wait. I just run my math function right away. This will allow also many instructions to execute at the same time, which gives you parallelism. All right. So here is a sequential model. I do C equals A plus B, X equals B multiplied by 10, Y equals B plus X, and C equals C plus Y. In a sequential model, let's assume each line takes one clock cycle. So over here, you take four clock cycles to finish, right? On a data flow model, you basically then realize that the first add, the first multiply can be done in parallel. I have A, I have B, I have 10. So they both will run in parallel in the first clock cycle. Then you spend one more cycle for the, add, the second add, one more cycle on the third add, and that's it. So over here, Four cycle over here three cycle faster by how much 25 percent right uh quick fact is the cpu you buy today imitate data flow model so you can still program in one neumann because which one is easier to program Huh? Sequential. sequential, right? You want your program to go from top to bottom. It's easy to think, to think about. But now, because we, we saw the benefit in data flow model, so if I don't build the hardware, so it's fake data flow, even though you have sequential program. We will learn how the CPU do this in the Hublot Com Art class, not this semester. If you're interested, if you're interested uh, it's called out of order execution. There are tricks you can do to make sure this happens. And also, this is also why your CPU is really fast. And why your CPU is actually, if you do single thread, why your CPU is way faster than the GPU. All right, so let's do a quick break uh, here. Uh, then we'll resume in 10 minutes. So this is kind of like a, a prelim for the rest of the material so that you understand the diagram a little bit better. Okay. So I'll talk about super basic digital design is not even 101, it's like 001. That this thing called wire. Wire, when I draw it on a diagram, will be a line. What, need, what you need to assume is that 
if I put any value on a wire, it's the same value for the entire thing. Because it's a wire, I have to have the same voltage. So I cannot have like five voltage on a wire. It has to, it has to be the same value. Then when you have the register, the register you talk of, we talked about this already, right? Somehow it can be, I can draw it as a box. I have input, I have an output. These are wires. And when I have this little number on wires, it means that that wire is seven bit wide. It means that I can send seven bits data. If I don't have the letter seven, I have 10, it means that that wire can send 10 bits data at a time. So the input and output in this case for your 86 ISA is going to be 64 bits input and output for sample, right? Then the register can also have the ID, right? The register file, you need to say, I want EAX, I want EBX, so that's the ID. Which one do you want? And then another input is read or write. Am I reading from it? Which means if I'm reading from it, I'm going to produce an output. If I'm writing to it, my output is nothing. It is, as we would say, don't care. It can output some signal, I don't care because I'm writing to the register. Why is don't care simpler than output nothing? Because we cannot output nothing. Zero voltage means I output zero. There's, not, there's no such thing as nothing. We can't just say, hey, I'm gonna ground this output. No, we can't do that. Why do we decide on zero? I mean, because we can represent it in binary zero and one, and usually zero voltage means it's a ground voltage, whatever that voltage is. Well, because the thing is, is your wire is a physical thing, right? You can't just say, hey, I want to change this to output nothing, so I'm going to change the CPU by grounding this thing. You can't do that. So we just say, don't care. It means that it would, it would, we would have some measurement in there, but the logic will not, will not, will disable whatever that, that thing is. That's a way to do that. Clock. When you buy a CPU, you know that that's a clock. What does clock mean? Basically, if you think about it, I, I'll use this um, for the purpose of simplicity. I'll use the light here. All right. On uh, online, I guess I'm not sure how you, I can say that, but let's just do demo here first. Okay. So let's say I want to send the data zero zero zero, and I say this is zero one. Okay. How do I send zero zero zero? Oh, that's why I need a clock. That's why I need a clock because I would say that, for example, if I put the clock to be one second, it means that I measure for three seconds, right? The first second lights it off, zero. The second second lights it off, zero. The third second lights it off, zero. Every time I have a clock that separates the two numbers. So in your design, you can actually measure the signal. Imagine have a voltage, voltmeter that measure the signal, right? Your clock will have something like this. One zero, one zero, one zero, and when you rotate one cycle, it means that you go from zero to one and back to zero. So this is one cycle. This means that whatever value on the wire is better be in one. It better be one single value. If you want to read something from the wire, it should become stable at either zero or one. And when you go to the next cycle. Again, you then read the wire, it's a zero or one. That's that's how you can read the data. That's why we need a clock. Faster clock means that I can send my data at a faster rate. That's why in many cases we would like to have faster clock. All right. Why does faster clock consume power? In this particular diagram, whenever you flip from zero to one, that burn power. If you, for example, have to send data zero and then zero and then zero and zero again, you actually don't burn power. But if your wire has to send zero, then one, then zero, then one, zero, then one, that burns more power. So 
they have actually designed that look into like, hey, how can I minimize what we call bit flip in the wire to save power, right? Uh, gate or things like, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that. Basically, 4 gigahertz means that, oops, sorry. I do up and down at the frequency of 4 gigahertz, which means that every one over for like one quarter of one nanosecond, so 0.25 nanosecond, I flip a clock from one to zero to back to one. This is a wire in the Motherboard, yeah, great question. Every, every computer, that'll be a clock wire that connects all the components. So to be this like global wire, and you have to make sure that it is propagated properly. So to be like amplifier to amplify the signal and all those things to maintain the clock. Huh? So if the CPU is running at this speed, it's running at different speed. Great question. GPU has its own clock in the in the graphic card. VRAM also has its own clock. With the but when you buy DRAM, you can see like DDR say five three thousand something. That's the but speed. That's DRAM clock. It's dictated by the memory controller on your on your CPU. CPU has another like set of chip called the memory controller. That whose job you learn actually whose job is control to control DRAM. And they have their own clock there because DRAM can clock as fast as CPU. They'll, they'll, they will not read data properly too fast. So basically, it's one of the yeah. yeah. One of the reasons why clock has to be at most certain speed is let's say you want to send a signal here, right? It's physics. Sometimes the voltage would fluctuate a little bit before it's settled at some value. So let's say this is your signal, right? It might be going this and then fluctuate a little bit before it arrives at that signal. That's why you need a clock because you need to wait a certain time until I can read the data. Your memory has to be that fast, not more, because otherwise I cannot guarantee that I read the correct data. It's too fast. I'm still in the fluctuation period. I, didn't, I haven't reached the, the plateau yet. Yeah. So, Gate. These are something that looks like this is the AND gate. And it works like AND, like I have two inputs A and B. Not AND means that A and B, then you not the whole thing. This is OR. This is not OR, nor. And the way it works is like what you learn in Cisco and OR, right? Same logic. MUX, this is something new, and we use this a lot. So MUX will multiplex the input. This is called the select signal. You have multiple inputs. The select signal will forward whatever wire you select as an output. This is as if like I have to switch case based on select. If select is this, output is this. If select is this, output is this. And fun fact, when you write the hardware in the hardware description language, it does look like a switch case. With the default by saying default, use this. Uh, DMUX is when you have the opposite of this. Basically, one input you must demultiplex into multiple outputs. Yeah, so there are chips in the. So there are there like wiring and some circuits, basically, to select whatever. Uh, whatever output you want from an input. So they can be like number, certain number of inputs, certain number of outputs, and you basically kind of connect them. Oh, it's a one. So, like, you can get it over. Yeah. Oh, everything then. Sometimes you need to, like, the same thing, yeah, the same thing through multiple components. All right, so uh, representing data is binary. Data as an input, data as an output, data in binary. Um, you handle data by moving the data around by change the voltage value. That's it. Every single clock cycle, you send a piece of data, done. Every single clock cycle, send another piece of data, done. All right, and you store uh, the, the data that you work with 
is just the voltage value. Reading mean I measure the voltage is that a one or is that zero? Writing means that I change the state of my storage from zero voltage to one and a half voltage, for example. Everything in your program is the data. So once you have this concept, it means that if you can control electrical signal, you're good. You can have a functioning computer. All right. We will leave today with with that. That's it. Tomorrow, uh, next Tuesday, we will do a demo on RPC and TRPC, followed by the ISA basic. And we will now move into the hardware design. All right. Hopefully, this is interesting for you all. And I am sure that you might be realizing that in your life, you're not going to use it. And that's true. But it's good to know the design so that if you need to buy a computer or you need to design a software for a certain computer, you know how to design it. All right. Um, yeah, that's it for today. Thank you so much. Uh, you might realize I, I, I also talk louder. Usually that's happened when I get excited. This is like my topic. So. <laughs>